In this video, I will explain one of the earliest and most crucial experiments in the history of quantum mechanics, the stern gerlach experiment. As I go through the explanation, you will learn how it demonstrated the need for a departure from classical mechanics and how it provided convincing evidence for two specifically quantum ideas, the quantization of angular momentum and the uncertainty principle. Additionally, I will explain how this experiment illustrates a still unsolved problem in quantum mechanics, the measurement problem. Okay, so what is the setup in the stern gerlach experiment? It begins with an oven that contains many silver atoms. These atoms are heated in the oven, so they have high energies and are bouncing all over the place. A small hole is placed at one end of the oven to allow some of the atoms to escape. They come out in all sorts of directions. So a screen with a small slit is placed in front to allow only the atoms that can fit through the slit to pass through. This allows them to then be directed into an inhomogeneous magnetic field. The final step is for a screen to be placed on the other end to detect how the atoms are affected by the interaction with the magnetic field. Now, before I show you what the results of the experiment are, I'd like to explain what is expected to occur in the framework of classical mechanics. For this, we will make a very simple model for the silver atom. According to this model, the silver atom is made up of a nucleus that has many protons and neutrons. Surrounding this nucleus is 47 electrons. And 46 of these arrange themselves in such a way that they form a spherically symmetric cloud with no net angular momentum. However, the silver atom as a whole does have an angular momentum and it is due to the intrinsic momentum or spin of this 47th electron. So this gives the atom a magnetic moment that is equal to the magnetic moment of this single electron. But what is a magnetic moment, and why is this significant? A magnetic moment is part of a term that contributes to the overall energy. So if you write down the total energy of this atom, there will be several terms. And one of them will be the interaction energy of the magnetic moment with the magnetic field. And it's given by negative 1 times their dot product. This is significant because the force that the atom will experience as it goes through the field is given by this next equation, which as you can see is the partial derivative with respect to z of their dot product. This is why it's very important that this magnetic field is inhomogeneous. Otherwise this derivative would be zero and there would be no force on the atom. This is probably also a good time to clarify that the coordinates that we will be working in here are that the positive z direction is up and the positive x direction is to the right. Okay, so I'll give you just a few moments to let all that sink in and to think about what we should expect if we repeated this experiment many times. What kind of distribution should we see at the end screen after the atoms go through this magnetic field? Now in the framework of classical mechanics, we would expect there to be all sorts of magnetic moments for the silver atoms in this oven. And since the force that the atoms experience is directly proportional to the direction of the magnetic moment in the z direction, then we expect to eventually get a distribution of impacts on the screen that is evenly spread over some region. So it should look something like this. However, the experimental results show something astonishingly different. There are in fact only two regions where the atoms impact the screen. And the total number of impacts are split 50-50 between the two with absolutely zero impacts occurring in this middle region. Now, how in the world could this occur? It must be that the magnetic moments of the silver atoms in the oven only take on two values in the z direction. They are either z up or z down. And since this magnetic moment is caused by the spin or intrinsic angular momentum of the electron, this shows that angular momentum can only take on a discrete set of values, or to use the more technical term, it is quantized. Now, this result is interesting in its own right. However, things become much more interesting if this experiment is performed sequentially. And what I mean by that will be clarified by the following schematic diagram. First, let's isolate this inhomogeneous magnetic field that was set up in the z direction, and we'll call it a stern gerlach apparatus in the z direction. We'll represent the two possible results as z up or z down. So the atoms from the oven will go into the stern gerlach apparatus and come out either as z up or z down. The next thing we'll do is to put another stern gerlach apparatus immediately after the first one. But in this instance, we will block the atoms that come out as z down and only let in the atoms that are z up. And the outcome of this is that we will see that 100% of the atoms are z up and no atoms are z down. 
This shouldn't be surprising, right? Since we seem to have filtered out the atoms with the property of being Z down earlier. Okay, so let's try another setup. This time, let's have an inhomogeneous magnetic field that is oriented in the X direction. So we'll have a stern gerlach apparatus oriented in the Z direction, followed by one that is oriented in the X direction. And we'll do the same thing as before. After passing through the first apparatus, we will only let the atoms that are Z up go into the second apparatus. So what do you think should happen here? It turns out that there's a 50-50 split with the atoms that come out. 50% are what we will call X up, and 50% are X down. Again, this may not appear as anything too surprising. Since it looks like at this stage, we've simply filtered out all the atoms that have the property of being Z down, and kept only those that are Z up. And of these, 50% also have the property of being X up, while the other 50% have the property of being X down. Okay, so the next step is where things get extremely interesting. We'll insert a third stern gerlach apparatus, and this time one that is oriented again in the Z direction. And we will filter out the atoms that are X down and only take in atoms that are X up. So to be extremely clear, our setup is that we send atoms into an apparatus oriented in the Z direction. We take only the atoms that are Z up and send them into another apparatus in the X direction. Finally, we take only the atoms that are X up and feed them into an apparatus oriented in the Z direction. And at this stage, if all we've done is simply observe the properties of being Z up and X up that these atoms have, then we might expect to see 100% Z up come out here. But that is not the case. Amazingly, we get a 50-50 split again. 50% Z up and 50% Z down. How could this be possible and what conclusions should we draw from these results? So I won't give an analysis of what's happening here in this video. I plan to make another video where I use the axioms of quantum mechanics to do a detailed analysis on what's going on. However, there are still numerous conclusions to be drawn and I would like to emphasize three of them. First, as I mentioned earlier in the video, this experiment shows that angular momentum is quantized. Instead of taking on values in a continuous range as we would expect classically, angular momentum can only take on certain discrete values. Secondly, we cannot measure the angular momentum in the z direction and in the x direction simultaneously. Somehow, when we measure the momentum in the x direction in the second stern gerlach apparatus, this destroys information we had about the atoms all being spin up in the z direction previously. This is just one example of what's known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is a principle that gives a limit to how precise our simultaneous knowledge of specific pairs of physical quantities can be. Lastly, measurements in some sense change the state of the system. If at each step of this experiment, we simply looked at the property of being spin up or spin down that we assume each atom to have, then how could it be possible that spin down in the Z direction reappears after we filtered out all the atoms with that property? It must be that somehow the act of measuring doesn't just observe what is the state of a system, but in some sense, it actually changes the state of a system. And it is precisely this feature that makes quantum mechanics such a radical departure from classical mechanics. The question of what exactly is going on when we make a measurement is what has given rise to a still unsolved problem, the measurement problem. And it is this notorious problem that is the driving force behind the various interpretations of quantum mechanics that you may have heard of. From the many worlds interpretation, to the Copenhagen interpretation, to the one taught in most undergrad classes today. Shut up and calculate. Each of these interpretations give wildly different answers to just what is happening when the act of measurement occurs. I plan to make a video covering each of these interpretations in detail, so remember to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned.